The Pandora Papers scandal saga continues. President Guillermo Lasso of Ecuador was summoned once again by a constitutional commission to declare about offshore assets. And the Piñera family was also cited to offer testimony on the case of the Dominga Mining Company sale. Havana and Managua strengthen ties of friendship and solidarity. 1.2 million vaccines against COVID-19 arrived in Nicaragua from Cuba to continue the immunization plan. Iranian and Russian naval authorities have reached good agreements on the expansion of bilateral naval cooperation. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your host, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. In Ecuador, President of the Constitutional Guarantees Commission, Jose Cabascango, summoned for the second time the President of the Republic, Guillermo Lasso, in order for him to deliver information on the investigation called Pandora Papers, in which he is allegedly linked. Kaoskango emphasized that the president must attend the session to be held on Friday, October 22nd. The legislator warned that failure to comply with the summons of a parliamentary commission is a cause for impeachment. In the event of a first convocation, Lasso assured that he may receive the members of the commission in the government palace, which is an irrespect to the normal course of assembly. Lasso had indicated that the National Assembly is not competent in this case, and it is up to the state's general controller's office and has maintained his narrative that he has repeated everywhere, that since the, he presented his candidacy for the presidency of the republic in 2017, he was not involved in holding offshore companies in tax havens, nor has any relationship with them. We we'll remain on topic. Relatives of Chilean President Sebastián Piñera will be summoned to testify in the Dominga mining cell case as part of an investigation on the head of state involvement in the Pandora Papers scandal. The assessing commission of the constitutional accusation against Piñera agreed to inv invite the First Lady Cecilia Morel, as well as her children, Cristóbal Magdalena and Sebastián Piñera Morel, as the Piñera Morel family was originally the largest shareholder of the Dominga project and its sale back in 2010, when Piñera recently assumed the presidency. The Chilean president sold the mining project in the Virgin Islands. In the contract for this business, the buyer requested that the zone where the project will be carried out not be declared an environmental protection zone. Once Piñera became president, that condition was satisfied, which was contrary to legal and ethical principles. And the democratic and popular sector called on Prime Minister Ariel Henry to dismiss the National Police General Director Leon Charles. The statement was made by the spokesperson of the democratic and popular sector, Andrea Michel. The opposition party of assassinated President Jovenel Moïse pointed out that Charles showed no willingness to restore security in the country and blamed him for the recent gang attacks, also including the kidnapping of 70 missionaries from the United States and Canada. The political party also demanded that Prime Minister Henry organizes a consensus government by October 20th. The party members said they will give the top diplomats government until November 1st to comply with the request. If not, the group stated they will side with the opposition. Union and civil society groups protested in Panama City against a questioned reform of the electoral code and consider a mockery that the country's president, Laurentino Cortizo, has only vetoed an article of the legislative project. The Secretary General of the Single National Union of Construction and Similar Industry Workers, Saul Mendes, said the demonstration objective was not only to reject the electoral reform, but also the code, since they both were undemocratic. According to preliminary data from the Ombudsman Office, more than 4,000 people participated in the mobilizations. The executive's decision raised harsh criticism among the deputies themselves, the political class and civil society, as it did not object to the most controversial issues or demanded the inclusion of articles in favor of gender parity, allocation of seats, financing or political parties, nor the criminal electoral jurisdiction.
In Mexico, despite the COVID-19 prevention measures and the control of the migratory flow, citizens of different nationalities are preparing a march for freedom, dignity and peace, which will attempt to leave this Saturday from the city of Tapachula in the state of Chiapas, heading for the country's capital. The asylum seekers coming from Haiti, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua and six other countries are organizing this mobilization that hopes to obtain permission from the Mexican Commission for Refugee Aid or the National Institute of Migrations. Tapachula has become the obligatory passage for asylum seekers to cross the border to the United States and also a kind of prison. Mexican authorities assure that they will not allow undocumented people to cross the country and ask them to wait for a response from the competent bodies in migration matters. And we have more. Colombian President Ivan Duque denied any possibility of resuming diplomatic relations with the Venezuelan government during a meeting with the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, rejecting all efforts made by the Colombian Senate on this matter. In spite of the fact that it was on the Senate of Colombia itself, where the process that the Venezuelan parliament received in good faith was processed, giving way to a summons from the president of the National Assembly of Venezuela, Jorge Rodriguez, to discuss on Thursday the proposition approved by Bogota, hours later and without offering further information, the same president of the Colombian Senate took a step back and pointed out that only the president, Ivan Duque, is qualified to retake relations with Caracas. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, had highlighted the importance of resuming relations of brotherhood and cooperation between the two nations, a position he has maintained over time for the welfare of the peoples of two nations. And the asylum seekers who cross Colombian territory on their way to North America, especially children and young people, are recruited by army groups operating in the Department of Antioquia. This was denounced by Carlos Camargo, the ombudsman of that country. The denounce was made during the international meeting of ombudsmen that took place in Cartagena, northern Colombia, where the official, in addition to explaining the seriousness of the migratory crisis generated by the passage of thousands of migrants, currently 10,000 stationed in the Department of Antioquia, assured that the illegal armed groups have taken girls, boys and young migrants from the process of forced recruitment, a common practice in Colombia that constitutes a serious violation of the rights of children. The Colombian ombudsman also stated that the harboring of thousands of people between Nicocli and Hakandi puts the lives of entire families at risk, who in desperation, because of waiting time and the terrible conditions in which they remain in the area, decide to take boats and other means of transportation without any guarantee of safety. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. from the south. Havana and Managua strengthen ties of friendship and solidarity. 1.2 million vaccines against COVID-19 arrived in Nicaragua from Cuba to continue the immunization plan. The batch of Abdallah and Soberano II vaccines is the first shipment of the three plants before the end of the year to complete the 7 million doses agreed between the two countries. The Nicaraguan government prepares for the distribution of this drug to the population free of charge and voluntarily. Since March, Nicaragua has been carrying out the vaccination against the coronavirus in people over 30 years of age, chronically ill and pregnant women with the vaccines AstraZeneca, COVID Shield, Sputnik V and the Pfizer. Residents of Argentina's capital are now allowed to go without wearing masks for the first time since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
The measure only applies to open places and comes after the capital city reached 70 percent of its population fully vaccinated against the novel coronavirus. The government of President Alberto Fernandez had allowed people to stop wearing masks in open spaces nationwide from October 1st, but it was up to individual cities to implement this measure. Coronavirus occupancy of intensive care beds in the public health system is now 3.2 percent, an all-time low record. Some 31.5 million people have received one dose of a vaccine, while about 24.8 million have received two doses out of a population of some 45 million. And we move on to other topics. Venezuela is moving steadily towards its regional elections to be held this November 21st. For this reason, the National Logistic Committee, consisting of Minister of the Interior, Remigio Ceballos, the President of the National Electoral Council, Pedro Calzadilla, and the utility companies Corpoelec, CanTV, and MobileNet met to review the strategy for the deployment and custody of electoral material, which, according to Minister Ceballos, is fully guaranteed. We are strengthening the security to guarantee the efficiency of the electoral process of November 21st to guarantee the security of the more than 14,000 voting centers in the 335 municipalities nationwide, in such a way that the citizen security bodies and the Bolivarian armed forces are in perfect coordination to guarantee a clean and secure process and thus the full deployment of the electoral material, its protection so the electoral process can be carried out in a safe and secure manner so that all Venezuelans can exercise their right to vote. And the Parliament of Barbados this Wednesday laid down one of the final steps to the Caribbean nation becoming a republic on electing its first president, putting an end to the colonial vestige of the British head of state. In a special joint session of Parliament, the House of Assembly and the Senate, as a collective, voted on the election of Governor General Dame Sandra Mason, who will become the island's first president on November 30th, Independence Day, and the date on which Barbados becomes a republic. This step will officially end Queen Elizabeth II's tenure as head of state. Barbados thus puts an end to 396 years of the rule of a British head of state, in effect since English colonial landed on the Caribbean island in 1625. After the voting session at the Parliament, Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Matli, referred to her country's struggle for true independence. I've had a journey that has been, in our view, one that has fought against all oppression and exploitation to reach to the point where, sir, we are in a position to claim our own destiny. We, we have reached this moment on the eve of our 55th year of independence. And we all know in our own lives that to reach 55 if you are not comfortable with yourself, if you are not confident in yourself, then something is fundamentally wrong. And this government, like those who went before and who expressed confidence in the journey, even if not completing the process, we believe that the time has come for us to claim our full destiny. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. On Thursday, Iranian and Russian naval authorities have reached good agreements on the expansion of bilateral naval cooperation. 
The announcement was made by the chief of the general staff of the Iranian Armed Forces, Major General Mohammad Hussein Bakari, during a meeting with the Deputy Commander-in-Chief of the Russian Navy Vice Admiral Vladimir Lovich Kazanatov in St. Petersburg. Bakari announced at a press conference that Russia and Iran reached good agreements on naval operations and participation in future Russian maritime drills and mutual exchange of operational experience. Pakistani Foreign Minister Sah Mahmoud Qureshi met with Taliban interim government officials in Kabul on Thursday, following weeks of tension over transport links between the neighboring countries. The two sides discussed various aspects of matters concerning mutual interest and enhancing cooperation in trade and economic departments. Qureshi will also share Pakistan's perspective on issues of regional peace and stability, the Foreign Office said. Pakistan also highlighted that the country has always stood by Afghanistan and kept the border crossing points open for trade and pedestrian crossing under Covenant team protocols. The meeting came a day after the international meeting hosted by Russia and attended by the Taliban. Earlier, the insurgent group has also met with the U.S. and the European Union. The United Nations launches a funding program aimed at preventing the Afghan economy from collapsing during the winter by getting cash flowing through the local economy again. 97% of households in Afghanistan could be below the poverty line by early to mid-2022. 97%. It does not take much imagination to understand that the implications of this in terms of disruption, not just to livelihoods, but to a nation and ultimately to the lives of millions and millions of people, is enormous. We have to stabilize a people's economy and in addition to saving lives in the immediate, we also have to save livelihoods because otherwise we will confront indeed a scenario through this winter and into next year where millions and millions of Afghans are simply unable to stay on their land, in their homes, in their villages and survive. European leaders gather for a meeting in Brussels on the first day of a two-day summit. The summit will address strong concerns sparked by the energy crisis, as well as the political situation in Poland. Spain's president of the government, Pedro Sánchez, welcomed the steps taken by the European Commission to explore measures to alleviate the energy price crisis, although he regret the slow response. The president of the European Council, Charles Michel, also called on the European Council to agree on joint measures to halt the escalation of energy prices. and supporters of Sudan's transitional government took to the streets of the capital on Thursday as rival demonstrators kept up a sit-in demanding a return to the military rule. Both sides appealed to their supporters to keep apart and refrain from any violence, but there was a heavy police and troop presence around potential flashpoints. The two sides, representing opposing factions of the Forces for Freedom and Change, the civilian umbrella group that spearheaded nationwide demonstrations that led to the army's overthrow of longtime President Omar al-Bashir in 2010. 2019, I beg your pardon. The mainstream faction backs the transition to civilian rule, while supporters of the breakaway faction are demanding the military takeover. Since Saturday, the pro-military faction has been holding a sit-in outside the presidential palace. Ahead of Thursday's demonstrations, leaders of the rival factions appealed for calm, as troops and police cordon roads leading to the protest. Kidnappings by irregular groups continue in Nigeria. On Wednesday, 30 people were held captive after men dressed in military uniforms set up a checkpoint in western Nigeria. The kidnappers held three passenger vehicles in the state of Niger after blocking the Rafi Highway. According to police sources, 30 people were allegedly held against their will and investigations have already begun. Although the identity of the captives is not known, the mass kidnappings have been linked by police to extremist groups, whose preference is for women, children, students, and members of Christian or Catholic religious communities. For its part, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees assures that more than 1.37 million people have not been able to return to their homes and could be in the hands of the terrorist organization Boko Haram.
now we address other topics. In Spain, new activity of Cumbre Vieja volcano on the islands of La Palma in the Canary Islands led authorities to order new evacuations on Wednesday evening. According to information released by the Canary Islands Regional Emergency Service, the preventive measure involved about 40 to 50 homes in the towns of Los Llanos de Aridane and Tazacorte considered at risk due to advancing lava flows. Since the start of the eruption of 19 September, an estimated 7,000 people have been evacuated, local media reported. Thus far, lava flows have buried around 866 hectares of land and destroyed over 2,000 buildings, including hundreds of homes, according to the latest update. In China, at least four people were killed and 47 injured after a gas explosion in northeastern part of the country on Thursday. According to authorities, the blast erupted in a restaurant at a mixed-use commercial and residential building in Xinjiang city of Liaoning province on Thursday morning. A cloud of dust and debris blew onto a busy street, damaging nearby buildings and vehicles, sending passengers fleeing. So far, all the injured have been sent to hospitals. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesuitenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesuit English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.